That's why we can make boast of what we've got and what we can do. Because we trust in the power of his might. Amen? Amen. Now that's, that's very important. I'm coming, just want to have to show you something along that line. But let's look at verse 11. Same book, same chapter. Put on the whole. Did he say some? Uh-uh. Put on the whole armor. The whole armor of God that he may be able to stand against the wires. What do you mean wires? Stratagems of the devil. That she may be able to stand against the wires of the devil. Why? Why do we have to do that? Tells us in verse 12, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood. In other words, your grandma is not your problem. Your mother-in-law, your sister-in-law, your father-in-law, your outlaws, they're not your problem. Your problem is over here. He says, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness. Did you see that? Did you see that? The rulers of the darkness. The darkness. The darkness. Rulers of the darkness. <sighs> my, 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 my. Oh boy. The rulers of the darkness of this world. The darkness of this world. The darkness of this world. Then he says, see, it gets worse. Against spiritual wickedness in high places. And he's not talking about our soul rock. I'm telling you, yeah. He's not dealing with governors and, and heads of states. I read a book one time and he began to say that the principalities and the powers are the heads of states and government. That's terrible. He's dealing with spiritual beings. Already he's told us we wrestle not against flesh and blood. If, if, if that's true, then he means that these principalities and powers and the rulers of the darkness of this world and spiritual wickedness in high places, these four classes are not flesh and blood because he already said so. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities. That means those principalities are not flesh and blood. Come on. Isn't that clear enough? They're not flesh and blood. He's, he means our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against principalities of evil, powers of evil, rulers of the darkness of this world. He didn't say rulers of the darkness in heaven. He said the rulers of the darkness of this world. And then spiritual wickedness in the heavenly realms. No wonder. No wonder there's a lot of trouble in the world. No wonder. No wonder there's a lot of trouble in the world. Look at that little guy who was born deaf and dumb. Why? His eardrums are there. Why? Everything is complete. Why then? Is he deaf? Something's got to be wrong. How come that three-year-old boy can't walk? He's got no more legs, but he can't walk. The doctors examine him, they can't find any problem. They can't find anything wrong with him, but he can't walk. How come? Why is it so? When you study the way Jesus ministered, you discover there were evil spirits responsible for infirmities evil spirits responsible for sicknesses and diseases not all sickness is a direct cause of satanic presence but all sickness is of indirect satanic curse 
and most of them are of direct consequence of Satan's presence. Can, can I just show you something here in St. Luke's Gospel? Chapter number 13. Have you found it? <clears throat> I'm reading from verse 10. I want you to observe this very carefully. St. Luke's Gospel, chapter number 13. <clears throat> verse 10. And he was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath. Jesus was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath day. Verse 11. And behold, there was a woman which had a spirit of infirmity 18 years and was bowed together and could in no wise lift up herself. Now I'd like to remind you that the man who's writing is writing in retrospect. In other words, this was something that already had transpired. So he had seen what Jesus did. He had heard what Jesus said. And now he tells us that the woman had a spirit of infirmity. If he had been there before Jesus spoke, before he heard Jesus, or before he saw Jesus do anything to that woman, he would have only told us, Behold, there was a woman that was bowed together and could not lift herself. He may have not known that the woman had a spirit of infirmity. How did he get to know? Because of what Jesus said. Praise the Lord. So we don't know things that are spiritual except with the light of God's word. We don't know that the devil is behind the case except by the guidance of the Holy Spirit. We just don't know. We assume things have happened all by themselves. Then we think, well, maybe somebody's got good luck and another one has bad luck. There's no such thing as luck. You're either working in a blessing or in a curse. There's no good luck and there's no bad luck. Someone says, well, if I'm lucky, you cannot be lucky. Doesn't matter how many times they call you lucky, you're not lucky. <laughs> Praise God. All right, now look at verse 12. And when Jesus saw her, it is wonderful. When Jesus saw her, oh, thank you, Lord. He called her to him and said unto her, Oh, dear. He said, Woman, thou art loose from thine infirmity. He spoke words. He said, Woman, thou art loose from thine infirmity. And he laid his hands on her. And immediately she was made straight. She couldn't lift up herself proud of that time. Pick it up. She couldn't lift up herself proud of that time. The Bible says she was bowed together. And she just walked that way. And Jesus saw her and said, Woman, he spoke words. He said, Woman. Praise the Lord. Amen. Well, and when Jesus saw her, he called her to him and said unto her, Woman, thou art loose from thine infirmity. He spoke words. He said, You are loose from your infirmity. Nobody talked like Jesus. Nobody ever said that to the woman. In fact, if anybody had said it, it wouldn't have worked. <laughs> Praise the Lord. All right, watch verse 13. And he laid his hands on her, and immediately she was made straight and glorified God. And watch this now, watch this now. And the ruler of the synagogue answered with indignation because that Jesus had healed on the Sabbath day and said unto the people, There are six days in which men ought to work. In them, therefore, come and be healed and not on the Sabbath day. <laughs> Hypocrites. <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> Verse 15. The Lord then answered him and said, Thou hypocrite. I thought so. Doth not each one of you on the Sabbath lose his ox or his ass from the stall and lead him away to watering? 
Oh boy, I love verse 16. That's where it is. He says, And art not, mm, art not this woman being a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan had bound? Lo, these 18 years be loosed from this bond on the Sabbath day. Did you see that? He said, Art not this woman, being a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan hath bound? Jesus said, Satan bound her. Somebody said, I don't believe in the devil. Doesn't matter that you don't believe. You might as well not believe in the force of gravity is still there. Somebody said, well, I don't believe in devil and I don't believe in God. Well, I believe in God, but not devil. See, you don't choose what you want to believe. The information has been given to us. There is a God. Hallelujah. And Satan is not the opposite of God. You know, some people say, well, there are two forces. The good force and the bad force. Force of good and force of evil. God is on the one side and devil is on the one side and they're fighting each other and they've been there all these years. <laughs> no, sir. The devil is a created being. Who created the devil? I'll tell you. How many of you know who created the devil? Do you know who created the devil? Who created the devil? No, God didn't create the devil. All right, I just got you. <laughs> God never made a devil. The Bible says... After God had done everything, it was all good. He'll make a devil. Who made a devil? I'll tell you who made a devil. Lucifer made a devil out of himself. Hey, I heard one time one of the former presidents, Abraham Lincoln, precisely. He said, anybody above the, the age of 40 is responsible for his face. Because he had said he didn't like a particular man's face. They said, why? He's not responsible for his face. He said, anybody above the age of 40 is responsible for his face. And I think that's true. <laughs> now look at the way you're looking at me. You wanted to blame your mama and your father for your face. No, you're responsible for what you look like. Yeah, your mother gave birth to you. That's true. Both parents took care of you. Or anybody else may have taken care of you. But I tell you something. After the age of accountability, you begin to learn to be what you will make yourself. So every adult that's listening to me now, you are what you made yourself to be. You created this being with your name. This man or woman looking at me now, you looking at me now, you, you created what you're seeing. You are the maker of what you have right now. God created you. Yes. But the you that you are now is your handwork. <laughs> I'm telling you. Who cuts your hair? Talk to me. Your look is yours. It's your work. Who made your hair at the salon? You decided what you wanted to be. Come on, talk to me now. Who dressed you up this morning? Hey, who married your wife for you? <laughs> Come on. All the, all the kids you got running around the compound, who brought them forth? You. You made yourself what you are. See, God created you. Yes. But you have to know the difference between the one that he created and the one you became. <laughs> Thank you, Lord Jesus. That's why Jesus said, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. What do you mean kingdom of God? He's not talking about heaven. He's talking about the life of God, glory to God, the reign of God in the heart of man. Praise God. Amen. Amen. Jesus said, Ought not this woman, being a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan had bound, Lord, these 18 years, be loosed on the Sabbath day from this born? Ought not this woman, 
whom Satan hath bound. The devil bound her. That's what Jesus said. It's not the work of God. Some people would have said, oh, clear the way. Clear the way for the old woman. She's coming to church. And you know, she's going like that. They say, you know, she's been that for 18 long years. Um, uh, the, the, they say the works of God are mysterious. We never understand. She was a wonderful woman. Look, but this 18 years, she's just been bowed over. It must be the work of God. It's the will of God. Well, whatever God, whatever will be, will be, you know, some people. They think it's the work of God. Because nobody has been able to help her. So it's got to be the work of God. You've heard them on TV when the obituary, with gratitude to God, we regret to announce the sudden passing away of so and so. How could it be with gratitude to God, we regret to announce? That's a bundle of contradiction. How could you be so grateful and regret what you're grateful for? Why do we do it? Because we think death is from God. I mean, nobody can stand the power of his will. If God says you're going to die today, you're going to die today. Does God kill people? Somebody says, hmm? ah, ah, that has to be God. Ah, nobody is. God doesn't kill. Oh, yeah. In the book of Isaiah, he said, I'm, I kill and I make alive. I create good and evil. You know, a lot of people don't know how to study the Bible. God never contradicts himself. Does God make darkness? No. Understand it. Darkness never has to be made. The absence of light is the curse of darkness. You never make darkness. Have you ever seen anybody make darkness? No, no. When you take the light away, darkness necessarily comes. And when you bring the light back, darkness leaves. You never make darkness. So when you create light, you separate from the darkness. The darkness leaves. You have to study the Bible with the understanding of the revelation of God. It has to be consistent with the whole body of truth. Are you hearing me now? Could God be responsible for evil? Certainly not. You say, how do you know? It's simple. It's simple. Everybody had an idea about God, including Isaiah the prophet, who said, thus said the Lord, I create good and evil. That's Isaiah. You know, a prophet, the Bible says, the spirit of a prophet is subject to the prophet. In other words, the man who's prophesying can decide to speak now or later, can decide to stop talking while he begins to prophesy. He can decide to stop abruptly or to continue. He can decide to choose the language he's going to use. No, a lot of people don't think so. They think if you're going to prophesy, you just start talking, you don't know yourself anymore. Blah, 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 blah. Don't say the Lord, I am, blah, 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 blah. Yeah, and then you say, hey, so what did I say? Did I say something? <laughs> I mean, did you ever watch Covadis Domini? Remember Peter in that film, in Covadis? And Peter, an old man, he got beers, and then there's this little boy with him. All right? And then... Um, and he, he'd been thinking about Paul and so on and so forth. And then suddenly he said, I, I feel like I've got to go to Rome or something. And, and he's saying, Lord, uh, please talk to me. What do I do? You know, there's an old man trembling there. He said, oh, what, Lord, what shall I do? And then the little boy speaks. And then he says, hey, what did you say? And the guy says, I didn't say anything. Oh, that means God has talked to me. Why? Because the guy didn't know when he said what he said. That's not what makes it prophecy. When you prophesy, your brain is intact. Your mind is intact. Your intellect is intact. You know where you are. You know what you're saying. You hear yourself. You understand yourself. You can decide to stop talking or to continue talking. Whatever you want to say, you can say it. You can decide what language you want to put that prophecy. Do you understand what I'm talking about? So every time... Every time you hear a prophecy, it's important that you judge it with the understanding of the whole body of truth. 
So no prophet can take advantage of you. I mean, somebody one time, he said, God saith the Lord, I am the Lord, I change it not. I said, God didn't speak that language because that's not correct English. You can say, I change it not, I change not. Now, if God said it and God made those words, that means God broke the language. Come on, talk to me. Hey, come on. Just because you are talking, thus said the Lord, doesn't mean everything you're going to say is exactly God. God said, I am the Lord. I help at you. No. You spoke that language because you didn't go to school good enough. And that's all. I mean, that's no problem. Just go ahead and we understand the message. Thank you. But don't try to insist that the very words that you spoke exactly came from God as he said it. Somebody said, I just told you what I heard from God. Word to word. Yeah, brother, thank you because God is English. <laughs> Hallelujah. I mean, he's not British. Talk to me now. That's why he tells us the spirit of the prophet is subject to the prophet. And so his message ought to be judged by the understanding of the whole body or revelation of truth. In other words, you've got to know whether what he's saying is exactly consistent with the nature of God. So that was Isaiah's understanding of God. He's actually talking about the sovereignty of God. So we can understand his message in the context of God's sovereignty. But God's sovereignty doesn't mean that he's responsible for everything that comes. That God is sovereign doesn't mean that he's making the devil do what he does. Otherwise, you can hold him responsible for the lie you told last week. You can hold him responsible for writing wrong answers to your exam. Then everybody who didn't make the jam exam can hold him responsible for the A, B, and C's that they wrote down that were wrong. Talk to me now. You might as well hold him responsible for the landlord asking you for his money. So let's not get ourselves boxed into a corner just because we want to believe something that doesn't exist. No, that truth is something that you can line up with every truth of the Bible. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So, God was not responsible for that sickness. God was not responsible. Jesus said it was Satan that was responsible. He said, ought not those women whom Satan had bound these 18 years. 18 long years the woman was bound. Nobody could lose her. 